Well, I want to talk about a phrase today that is in Scripture that most of us are aware of and understand and you've heard. I'm not going to read a bunch of Scripture about this particular statement that is made in Scripture, but I'll tell you about it. And Jesus came to the earth, was born. We know the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, the upbringing of Christ. We know all of his years of coming to the age of 30 and then beginning his earthly ministry. And his earthly ministry operated from the age of 30 to 33 until his crucifixion. And we recognize and realize you can look at the stages of Jesus' life and development and come up and and, and I, I'm more in line with 30 being an age of maturity more than, than, than I am the 18 as far as really understanding that concept. But, but the, the point that I'm trying to get across to you is he comes to the place where he's crucified and he's on the cross and he makes a statement on the cross just before his death. Some writers believe it was the last thing that he says, you know, Matthew's gospel goes into the statement where he said, Lama, Lama, Allah Sabachthani, however that says, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me? But then in Luke, he definitely makes the clear statement when he says, it is finished. It is finished. Now, many scholars and different people take that interpretation, say, well, that was the point. He knew he was going to die and his earthly life was finished and he had done what he had accomplished, but the word that is in the Greek for it is finished, and I'll talk about that in a moment, is, is a more inclusive word than just my earthly life is over. But we've got to understand that at that moment when he said it is finished, he's on the cross, he immediately gives up the ghost. They had sent them to break their legs, but when they came to break their legs so they would go ahead and suffocate and die and not just be on the cross for hours and hours, he was already dead. They didn't have to break his legs. When he said, it is finished, the whole religious system that had been in operation for 4,000 years from the beginning of Genesis till his death got blown away, was fulfilled, was over with, was accomplished. It was finished. And from that moment forward, we had a new covenant. We have a new testament, if I can say it that way. A new change began in everything that we have in dealing with God. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, and I want you to just think. The statement that he made, it is finished. Now, there's a lot of things I want to say, but just to, to kind of help you or help me, you can agree or disagree. I've made this statement before to people, and people have gotten mad at me because they don't really understand what it is I'm saying. But you have to understand that everything Jesus wrote in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus wrote that as a man who was born under the law and came into the earth and he was talking to Jews, not born again Christians. We read those words as born again Christians and pull them off the page and want to make an application and we take out of context what he was saying. And I'm not, again, criticizing. I'm trying to help us to understand sometimes there's more to it than what you're seeing or what you're reading. 
Jesus was not speaking to born-again Christians. He was speaking to Jews who were under the law. Now, if you don't understand that statement, then you, it's real easy for us to misrepresent his words. We'll make statements like, well, Jesus said, and we go into something, and we say what he said, and he was using a parable because he was dealing with those who would understand what he was saying. He would get his disciples aside and say to his, his disciples who were under that system, would look at him and say, what did you mean when you were saying? And he would have to sit down and explain to them exactly what he was saying because he was making statements. He was on a mission. He came to fulfill a mission that his father had sent him here to earth to accomplish. And we have to understand that you and I live on, if, if this was the cross here, everybody in the Old Testament was looking to the cross and the death of Christ and looking at Jesus from this side. You and I are in a new covenant, a new testament on this side of the cross, and we're looking back at what he accomplished at the cross and in his life, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection, they didn't see that. None of those in the Old Testament were born again. None of those had the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. There's a whole lot of involved in, in all that was, was going on and be, being said with that. But the Old Testament was looking forward to Jesus. The New Testament, we are looking back at Jesus. Now, oh, help me, Lord. In my opinion, heard somebody say this week, preachers shouldn't give their opinions in the pulpit. I think all of us do whether we realize it or not. In my opinion, the greatest revelation that you will ever receive this side of the cross is not what he's going to do, but what he has already done. Now hear me. They were trying to get a revelation of what Jesus would do and what God was doing. If you get a revelation of what he's already done and you accept it and receive it, you'll be a part of everything he's going to do. Now, hear me carefully. The truth is, when he said, it is finished, it is finished. Say, it is finished. When Jesus said that, you need to understand that there's a finished work that Jesus came to the earth on a mission to fulfill, that he fulfilled, that he did, that he accomplished, that he has already completed that what you and I on this side of the cross must do is to receive into our lives what he has already done. It's what salvation is. I'm saved not because of what I do. I'm saved because I receive what he has already done. That's salvation. Now, Everything that's on this side of the cross, including the words of Jesus to the Jews, must be filtered through the cross. Years ago, I talked about the cross being a hermeneutical filter, and people ridiculed me or joked me, and kid talked about this hermeneutical because that's a word that very few people understand what it means, and, and, and I decided then I need to quit using words that people don't know what they mean but just follow me. I want you to read something from, I'm going to read something to you, several verses from Galatians, which I am reading to you from this side of the cross, looking back. Words of the Apostle Paul, and I want you to hear what he says 
to the Galatians. Galatians 2, verse 20, he says, My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. Think about that for a moment. Who you were before you accepted Christ no longer lives. You're not in Adam. Adam's not in you. You're in Christ and Christ is in you. But he says, no longer lives. And now the essence of this new, new life is no longer mine for the anointed one lives his life through me, we live in union as one. Now listen to me. We teach our little baby kids in nursery and in children's ministry here that you receive Christ as your Savior and Christ comes into your heart, into your spirit. You are born of the Spirit of God and God now lives on the inside of you. Okay? And that's what he's talking about here. Then he goes on and he says, My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, he's saying, Now that I've invited Christ into my life, I don't have to just live by my faith. I have his faith because he's living with me. We're in union together. And I have the ability to operate in the faith of the Son of God. That's what he's saying who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. Now, any time, and it doesn't always show it on the screen, but if it's in italics in the Bible, it's something that the interpreters added to give clarity to what's being said in the Greek because the, the, the language of Greek and Aramaic sometimes says much more than words we have. And this thing, dispensing his life into mine, is something they're saying, this is what this is talking about. Verse 21, so that is why I don't view God's grace as something peripheral. In other words, I don't nullify the grace of God with my own works. That's what he's talking about there. I don't see the grace of God as something I got to add anything to. I don't see the grace of God as it takes my two cents to make it happen. It's the grace of God. I'm saved by grace through faith, and that faith's not of myself. It's a gift, the gift of God. For if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, then Christ would have died for nothing. Church after church after church after church, Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian says, all you have to do is receive Christ. And when you receive Christ, you're saved. And they accept Christ. And then the next thing they do, they go, now here are the rules. It's what we do. It's what churches do. It's what Christians do. Pastor Farley, you just never know what they're going to do. You just never know what they do. That's right. And if you don't let your kids leave home and go to school and get involved in their own life, they're going to be babies their entire life. <laughs> Pastors, I'm not saying it's easy, parents, but parents have to let their kids grow up. Pastors need to let their children in the flock grow up. Almost every week, somebody comes to me. Pastor, do you know what I saw one of your members doing? Well, it's hard to tell because you know what? They're living their life for Christ themselves. I'm not responsible to live them. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not the one who's in charge of them. My job is to teach, feed, and mature them and hope that they get it. Now, yeah. 
He says clearly, if you can get righteousness, God's righteousness, by keeping the law, Christ died for nothing. Well, he didn't die for nothing. He died for a reason. Let's go on. Chapter 3, verse 1. Paul's writing to these Galatians. He's talking to Christians now. And he says to Christians, What has happened to you foolish Galatians? Who has put you under an evil spell? Did God not open your eyes to see the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion? Was he not revealed to you as the crucified one? So answer me this. Did the Holy Spirit come to you as a reward for keeping Jewish laws? No. You received him as a gift because you believed in the Messiah. Your new life began when the Holy Spirit gave you a new birth. Why then would you so foolishly turn from living in the Spirit by trying to finish by your own works? And that's what we do. You get saved in the Spirit. You accept Christ. Now you're born again. You have a new life. You're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You are now a Christian born of the Spirit of God. Now you think you want to try to perfect what He's already perfected in you. You think you want to add to what He's already done. That's what he's, Paul's talking to these Galatians about. Look at this. Have you endured so many trials and persecutions for nothing? Let me ask you again. What does the lavish supply of the Holy Spirit in your life and the miracles of God's tremendous power have to do with you keeping religious laws? The answer to that is absolutely nothing. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon you, on us, through the revelation and power of faith. And he goes into a little discourse here. Abraham, our father of faith, believed God, and the substance of his faith released God's righteousness to him. By the way, God's faith released to Abraham, and God's righteousness released to Abraham was 430 years before the law was given to Moses. Okay? Had nothing to do with the law, had nothing to do with that old covenant stuff. It was 430 years. He says that over in the next chapter of this book. Okay? By the way, I'm probably getting in trouble. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was from Ur of the Chaldees. He was in Iraq. Okay, go on. Smile at me. You know, it's, it'll amazing if you help you if you read your Bible. What you find out instead of listening to preachers on TV, watch. So the true children of God or the true children of Abraham have the same faith as their father. He got this 430 years before the law, and we have the same faith. And the Scripture prophesied that on the basis of faith, God would declare Gentiles, known as sinners through most of the Scripture, would declare Gentiles to be righteous. God announced the good news ahead of time to Abraham. Through your example of faith, all the nations will be blessed. And so the blessings of Abraham's faith is now our blessings too. But if you rely on works of keeping the law for salvation, you live under the law's curse, for it is clearly written, 
Utterly cursed is everyone who falls, who fails to practice every detail and every requirement that is written in this law. It is obvious that no one achieves the righteousness of God by trying to keep the law. For it is written, the one who is in a right relationship with God will live by faith. What is it that makes us think we get saved by grace through faith, we have the faith of God, God has now come living with us, we're fellowshipping with him, we're in union with him, we're walking with him, and we're going to try to tell him that we got some rules back here that was under the law that we need to implement in our life to, 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 to make this thing work. But that's what we do. Look at somebody and say, you're guilty, I'm not. I shouldn't have said that. We're all guilty, every one of us. Now, let's go to verse 12. But keeping the law does not require faith but self-effort. For the law teaches, if you practice the principles of the law, you must follow all of them. Watch this. Yet, Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. He absorbed the curse completely as he became a curse in our place. He didn't just die for us, he died as us, for it is written, Everyone who is hung upon a tree is cursed. Now watch. Jesus Christ dissolved the curse, dissolved the curse from our lives so that in him all the blessings of Abraham can be poured out upon Gentiles. And now, now through faith, we receive the promised Holy Spirit who lives within us. So when Jesus was on the cross, when he came to that moment where he was about to die and he declared, it is finished. What was finished? His life, not just his life on earth, as a human being, all of the law, all of the old covenant, all of everything that was in that had been completed and fulfilled. Now, let me just explain a minute. The word for finished here is the Greek word tetelestai, T E L E. T-E-T-E-L-E-S-T-A-I, and it means finished, it means complete, it means accomplished, it means it has arrived at its destination. Now, what does that mean to us? It means to us that Jesus did everything he was supposed to do and salvation is complete. Christ on the cross said it is finished. Tetelestai. What does that mean? He accomplished what he came to do. That's good. He finished his assignment, which is true. It's fulfilled. Everything back there is fulfilled. Now, follow me just a moment. When a messenger is sent out to do something and he's given a purpose, he's given an assignment, he's given something to do, there's a reason that he goes forth and he goes forth to accomplish a specific purpose to do what he was sent to do. And when he had accomplished what he was sent to do and he had fulfilled the mission, 
he would come back to his master and he would declare tetelesta, which means finished. He was saying, I have done everything you have sent me to do. The mission is complete. So when Jesus declared it is finished, do you remember what Jesus said when he came? He said, I didn't come into this world to be served. I came into this world to serve and to give my life as a ransom. I came into this world not to be served. I came to serve. He made statements like, I always do those things that please my father. He says, I do nothing except what my father tells me to do. He made statements like, I say nothing that my father doesn't tell me to say. So everything Jesus did was the Son of Man completely submitted to a heavenly Father and he was sent on an assignment and his assignment was to die and to live a life here on the earth. What do you mean? He was sent to this earth to become the gospel, to be born, to be crucified, to be buried, to be resurrected. That's what he came for. When the stone was rolled away while he was in the tomb, the stone rolled away represented the Old Testament Ten Commandments rolled away. They're no longer operable. Oh, that makes people mad, but I'm just telling you what it means. He was sent to become the gospel, and he was saying, it is finished. He was no longer a servant. People say, why did Jesus get baptized? He never sinned. Well, what happened at his baptism? At his baptism, his father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He went from being a servant to a son. Think with me for a moment. You remember, and I can go through story after story in scripture, but the prodigal son, the one that got his inheritance, went off and squandered it on wildest uh, riotous living and all the stuff that he did. He, he wanted to come back and be a servant, but the father never seen him as a servant. When he come back, he wasn't a servant. He was a son. God doesn't see you as a servant. He sees you as a son. He sees you as a child. Why? Because we're not on that side of the covenant. We're on this side of the covenant. You're a son of God, a daughter of God. You're a child of God. Now, Jesus said, it is finished. I have fulfilled the law completely. He's the only man who ever lived who fulfilled everything there was in the law. He never broke one law. He never did anything wrong. It is finished. It's complete. That aspect was accomplished. Now, I want to talk about an also. Everybody say also. When he said, it is finished, about that moment, when he said it is finished, it says he breathed his last breath, life left his body, and at that moment, 
Jesus, who was the high priest, who was the Lamb of God, at that moment, his blood was shed. He became, he was the high priest and the sacrificial lamb who at that moment, his life was given, his blood was shed. He is declaring to Lesto, it is finished. Now, what happened at that moment? You all all read this. This is nothing new. I don't, one of the reasons I'm not going through and reading all these scriptures is most all of us know this story. But in the Old Testament, under the law, once a year, the high priest, once a year, would take the blood of a lamb, of a turtle dove. He would take the blood. He would go in to the temple into the inner court and then go behind the veil and take blood into that most holy place and pour blood as a sacrifice upon the mercy seat. And that blood that he offered once a year was for all the sins of the people. And when he offered that blood inside that most holy place, that would satisfy the sins of everybody for one whole year. Problem was, you had to go back every year. You had to go back the next year. You had to go back the next year. So every year, something had to be done because the old covenant was under a blood sacrifice system. Now understand, Jesus, who was the high priest, Jesus, who was the sacrificial lamb, the old covenant, when they did the blood, only covered the sins of the people. Jesus came to not cover the sins of the people. The language is very clear in Scripture. He came to take away the sins of the people. Big difference in covering something and taking it away. Now follow me. Not only did you take away sin... When you take away sin, you are taking away past sins, present sins, and future sins because sin has been dealt with. I have preached this numerous times and people still think I'm wrong. They still don't understand. But the moment when he was on the cross and declared tetelestai, it is finished. It was a day and a time, listen to me, when the Passover was taking place and at the time of day that this happened, the high priest was over in the synagogue. He was in the temple and he was getting ready to go into the most holy place to offer a blood sacrifice to cover the sins of the people. And at that moment, if you can imagine the priests who were in their place there getting ready to go in and the veil of the temple that he's about to go behind is rent in twain from top to the bottom. That thing tears open that was three and a half or four inches thick some say it was 60 feet wide 30 feet high I don't know exact size because it's different different but my point is it wasn't somebody grabbed a string at the bottom and pulled it and it fell apart it was ripped from top to bottom at that moment it is finished Tetelesta. God was making a statement that the veil between God 
and man no longer remains. There is nothing between you and God. Everybody on planet earth has the ability to open up their heart where their spirit is and receive the God of the universe, the power of the high priest and the lamb into their life and you now have perfect access into the place where God is because you and I are now the temple. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit's the most holy place. Soul is the inner court. Your body is the outer court, tripartite. That's a whole different teaching. I wanted to get in that, but I don't want to deal with that today. I've taught it and I can teach it again. But I want you to get this. I want you to hear me say this today. I want you to realize when Jesus said, it is finished, you no longer have to go to anybody to have access to God. He comes to you. He walks with you. Now hear me. It's a new day. At that moment, it's a brand new day. Everything they had done religious-wise was finished. It was over. It was accomplished. It was no longer to be of any function. Everything before, if you really understand, everything in the law and the prophets spoke of him. That's why you find him throughout the Old Testament. You need to find him there. But it was pointing towards him and he fulfilled it. He fulfilled. He filled everything there was in the law. Tetelestai. Finished. What does it mean? Well, that means the law was done. That means the connection that man has with God is accomplished, it's finished. But there's also a, another example in that word, and the only way I know how to explain it is like this. The loan was paid in full. What do you mean? There's nothing you can do to add anything to something that's been paid off. The sin that Adam committed that affected all of humanity up until the moment Jesus went to the cross, the debt of that sin at that moment was canceled, paid for, satisfied completed, it's over, it is finished. No longer is it just, I'm forgiven. He became a propitiation, which means he paid our debt. It's paid in full. And if it's paid in full, there's nothing you can do to add to it. Nothing can be done. Now, here's what I want you to see. It is finished. Nothing in the law, nothing in that old covenant, nothing can be done. But now I have on this side of the cross a new life. Christ lives in me. Paul makes it clear here in Galatians. I was crucified when he was. When he was crucified, I was crucified with him. Matter of fact, let me, let me just read that to you one more time. Galatians 2.20, my old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We are live in union as one. 
My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. So that is, that is why I don't view God's grace as something peripheral that I can add to, for if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, then Christ would have died for nothing. So what I'm saying is to you, when the new birth happens, here's, don't we want to, here's, here's what we don't really see. We don't get the full impact of this. I now on this side of the cross receive Christ. And I have the life of God alive on the inside of me. Jesus, who did it, did it all, is living in me. And from this moment forward, because of what I know happened in my past, I'm not worried about my future because he's walking with me every step of the way. He is a part of everything I'm doing. He is alive inside of me. He is working inside of me. I'm going where he wants me to go. I'm doing what he wants me to do. My life is now his life. His life is mine. I'm living in union with him and everything I do and everywhere I go, he gets to go with me. I get him with me in every situation and every circumstance. So why don't you tell me what it is he he can't handle in your life. See, because when you can't handle something, here's what we do. I'm going to have to pray. I'm going to have to straighten something out. I'm going to have to find out what's wrong with me because if, I, something, not, if something ain't wrong with me, the enemy couldn't be doing this to me. Oh, I'm preaching really good whether you're getting it or not. What do you mean? What would happen if we would teach our kids from the day they are born, every day of their life, that the Lord Jesus Christ who conquered death, hell, and the grave, who kicked the teeth of the devil, put him in his place, totally conquered him, stripped him of all his power, is going to walk with them and talk with them and guide them, tell me what they're going to face in their life that can conquer them or defeat them or beat them. It may may look like they're going through something in the flesh or the natural, but I'm telling you, he will deliver them out of every single one of their problems, and we have the privilege of walking and talking with God. I'm not a bit concerned about our future because I got enough knowledge to know that all of the creation and the elements in this whole universe that he's created is waiting and in hope that there will be a manifestation of fully grown fully mature believers who are children of God walking and doing what they're supposed to do. Well, Pastor Farley, are you telling me that you're just not going to see what the devil's doing? I don't care what the devil's doing. Why? Why? Jesus already kicked his, you know what. I got to be careful because I will offend religious people. I like to say he already kicked his donkey. Those of you that read the King James Version know exactly what I'm talking about. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying the law is finished. The Old Testament is over. Quit putting the rules. Pastor Farley, if we don't have rules, if we don't have things to guide us, if we don't have things to help us, we're going to fail. I hope you got more confidence in your kids than that when you send them off. Sure, they're going to make mistakes. Sure, they're going to do things they shouldn't do, and so do you. So do I. But I don't have to worry about forgiveness. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. 
I don't have to worry about a consequence from that. Well, if you sow to the flesh, there's flesh things you reap. But, that's, that's, but I know who I am. I know what I have. And I know what's working in me. That's why I have absolutely no problem looking everybody on planet earth in the eye and saying, I love you. I will always love you. I accept you. I don't care where you are. If you're in sin or you're a babe in Christ or you're a child in Christ or you're an adolescent in Christ or you're a young punk in Christ or you're an adult in Christ, I will accept you. And there's nothing you'll ever do that I can't forgive you because you've already been forgiven given for sin, past, present, and future. Sin's not your problem. Your head and your mouth are your problems. As long as you keep confessing I'm sin and I'm dealing with sin, you're going to keep doing it. Once you realize he, know, he didn't cover your sin, he took sin out of the way. Well, are you saying people don't sin? I'm not saying people don't sin. People do stupid things every day. I do. That doesn't change who I am. Doesn't change who I am. Now, hear me say it. Sin has been dealt with for all time. The sin debt has been paid. The problem with Christians is they just don't believe it. But to those of you who do believe it and want to believe it, I want to read you some scripture here. In Galatians 3, I just read it to you a minute ago, but look at verse 2. It says, So answer me this. Did the Holy Spirit come to you as a reward for keeping Jewish laws? No. You received him as a gift because you believed in the Messiah. Now watch. Your new life began when the Holy Spirit gave you new birth. Born again. Baptized. New creature. Why then would you so foolishly turn from living in the Spirit by trying to finish by your own works? Why do we do it? Why? It's too good to be true to think that he walks with us and talks with us and lives with us and abides with us and helps us every step of the way. It is finished. The debt's paid in full. It's canceled. Now, in what I've just preached to you, there's one more thing I want you to get, and then I'm finished. I'm close. Some of you, to close with this message, will walk saying, Whew, it's finished. Now, follow me. That temple that had the Holy of Holies in it in that old covenant, that temple where God was behind the veil. When he said it isn't finished, that temple got moved. And on the day of Pentecost, that temple showed up in people. He came to take up his residence in the hearts of men and women. His spirit, his presence, his holy of holies now lives in us. It's a new day. It's a new era. We have a new kingdom. What happened? 
you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. I talked about this last week. As long as you keep reading the law, the veil goes up between your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your spirit. But when He comes in, the veil is removed. As long as people are out there in sin, they can read the Bible and there's a veil there. They'll never see it. But when you step into it, the veil is removed. Scripture is clear about that. I, you listen to last week's message. The veil is removed. And what's trying to happen right now, what God's wanting to do, is everything that I am in the Spirit, He's wanting my mind, my will, and my emotions. He wants me to think like Him, to feel like Him, to love like Him, to be like Him to begin to operate the way he wants to operate. What are you saying? My soul has access to God's Spirit, the Spirit of God, the same God that was back there inside the veil now lives in me and you. It's complete. It's finished. Better last time. It's accomplished. One more scripture. Galatians chapter 3, verse I start in 23, what did I give you? All right, I start in 24. The law was our guardian until Christ came so that we should be saved by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian of the law. You have all become true children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith immersed you into Christ and now you are covered and clothed with his life. And we no longer see each other in our former state, Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ. It's sad to me that we can't see Jesus is alive in his body this moment. We are the body of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are married to him. We are one. The church world out here who still lives in the old covenant wants to put so much more out there in our future and they're looking for God in the future when if you would find that he walks with you and talks with you and lives with you and guides you and takes care of you and is alive in you all of the time because of what he's already done, I have no fear of what's in front. Now, well, Pastor, you know how bad things are getting. No, I really don't. If you would turn that off and listen to your Bible, you'd be better off. Oh, well, you know, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. No, it ain't. You got it better than you ever had it or your parents had it or your grandparents had it or your great-grandparents ever had it. You got it made. And we're too silly to know it. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? It's time that the witchcraft stops and we start walking with God. Stand with me. Oh, Jesus, help me.
just think about it. I deal with situations every day. I, I don't always know what I'm going to do or how to do, but I start talking and helping, and I realize when I'm talking, God's talking, not me. God's speaking, not me. I realize. Somebody has a need. I have what it takes to meet that need. And I think, what a coincidence. It had nothing to do with coincidence. He lives with us. He walks with us. We just need to allow him to be real to us. Father, I thank you for this service. I thank you for the mind of Christ. I thank you for the revelation of your word. Father, impart to another generation your life, your love, your strength, your power. Bless us, I pray today, Father. Encourage us, Lord. Strengthen us, I pray. Guide us in every way. We'll give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.